beginning of Advent in the year 2015. Like Rachel, it is one of my favorite seasons of the year when we anticipate, and especially in the culture in which we live, that seems to speed up every year and get faster and faster. Advent causes us, calls us to pause and to process what is happening. And so this year, we celebrate peace on earth and joy to the world under the shadow of Isis and world mayhem. And all the destruction and the responses that are occurring, it almost seems not quite daily, but, but it's weekly now that something else is coming to say to us, this is not a very peaceful place in which we live. It is not a very secure place in which we live. The other night, went out again to eat. It seems I'm going to have to stop going out to eat because every time I go, there seems to be another shooting, another tragedy in our country, and it just occurred in Colorado just the other day. It was a couple of weeks ago, a month now or so, when the Oregon shooting occurred, and I happened to be catching a little bit of ESPN in a morning breakfast and the particular announcer that morning said before we start our show we just want to pause to remember those who have been killed and injured in the tragedy in Oregon and then there was a moment of silence and then just very succinctly and I thought so well did he sum it up he just looked at the camera and said what's up with humanity Perhaps in the times in which we live, we can begin to imagine how the people of Israel felt so long ago in the text that we read in Jeremiah when their nation was destroyed and their leaders were carried off to a distant land. Or maybe we can, more than usual, feel the uneasiness of those first hearers of Jesus' words that Lisa read for us. Words that speak of anguish and perplexity, terror and apprehension. Advent. A season in which we are caught between the joyful expectations of the promise of God and the harsh realities in which we live. Advent has come at the right time. For in Advent, the church proclaims an alternative reality that grows out of confidence in God's promises. Advent invites us to name the places in our own lives and the world in which we live that are at odds with God's purposes. And this year we have no trouble making that list. It is long. It is large. From our social and worldly issues all the way down to our own personal struggles, we can list and list and list. And it seems, and this is true, that in any age, in any situation of great suffering, the hazard is for those whose pain and loss is so great that they cannot imagine a different future. Why look to the future, they ask, if life holds the potential for so much pain. And yet, in the midst of this kind of suffering, Jeremiah speaks a word of hope, a promise of what is yet to be. Jeremiah doesn't say that things might get better. Jeremiah doesn't say that we should be optimistic about future possibilities. The prophet says that the days are surely coming. And you can count on it. You can take it to the bank because God is the one who is making the promise. Likewise. Jesus says in the midst of these events that will cause us to tremble with fear and apprehension, not to cower, but to stand tall and raise our heads up high. These words from Jeremiah and from Jesus call us to behave differently from what we see around us. And that is precisely what the biblical story has always recorded for us. The call to act against what our senses tell us. A word of personal confession. I believe 
that the Bible is true. Not because it tells me things that I already know and that I have already seen for myself. I believe the Bible is true precisely because it describes a reality that stretches beyond the boundaries of my finite mortal existence. And it is precisely that reason that it has the capacity to redeem me, to redeem you, yes, to redeem this scary world in which we live. Near the beginning of his Christmas poem, For the Time Being, written during the dark times of World War II, W.H. Auden pens the following confession. Nothing can save us that is possible. We who must die demand a miracle. And there it is. In the words of this author, when you are on the brink of death from illness or failure or disappointment or heartbreak or calamity or oppression or depression or burnout or whatever reason, when you are keenly aware that you are insufficient, you and I stand in desperate need of a miracle of the miraculous, for that which is merely possible, that we know evidently, truthfully, does not seem to be able to save us. And that, my friends, is what the Advent story offers, an impossible possibility, a truth deeper than all else we have been told, a story that stretches beyond our own stories to give them meaning and hope. And so as Jesus proclaims this promise, he also proclaims that those who embrace the promise of the present and future reality of the kingdom live a very different life from those who do not believe in his coming. They spend their energy in kingdom living rather than on anxiety or worry. Remember last week's text? And so these people who are followers of Christ, who believe in the kingdom that is coming and has come among us, we call it a church. And a church that lives and breathes God's promises holds up life and hope no matter what things may look like on the outside. In the midst of loneliness and despair, poverty and war, in the face of communal depression, and personal heartache, these churches throw open their doors and their hearts to all of God's children who have lost hope and have no personal vision of the future. These are churches that love worship and learning, churches that are open and generous, churches that long for and draw their strength from not what they see around them, but from the promises of God. And so as we join with God in this work, perhaps we will feel overwhelmed at times. Yea, we will feel overwhelmed at times. You will find yourself sitting some days with your head in your hands, knowing the needs that are out there, having given all you've got to give, and still the needs come. We will feel overwhelmed. It is not unreasonable in the face of so much brokenness. And so much despair for even us to lose heart. And yet, and yet we gather in Advent and we hear the words of the prophet and we hear the words of Jesus. The days are surely coming and so God sends the word of a prophet when the people have given up. Better yet, God sends a church full of them to speak a word of hope into the world in which we live. It is a message never more needed than today. When so many of our actions and our decisions seem to be driven by fear, not love. By a lack of confidence, not security. And an overwhelming sense, not of the abundance of God, but of scarcity. The risks are real. Bombs explode 
people lose jobs. Heartache comes because people make decisions that impact us that we have no control over. The risks are real, but still our texts today remind us that even in the midst of life's worst woes and collapsing securities, God has a word. God has a plan that is, in fact, working even now where we can't see it. And God is bringing all of history towards God, even as God was working in history at his first coming. God has a plan. God has a gracious set of promises that God will fulfill. Hardship does not have the last word. The tragedies that come ultimately do not define us. God's ways will not be upset by terrorists, by disease, even by death itself. Brothers and sisters, we are Advent people. We are called to live our lives by the promises of God, not by the news that we see every day on our tablets, our phones, on the television, and those that still read the newspaper. We are Advent people. We live our lives differently. And it is a life lived as if God's future were already here. Because we know the end. We know indeed that God is going to bring justice and righteousness. Therefore, we live as just people, as righteous people in a world that literally is falling apart. But rather than cowering in, rather than closing our doors around us, we proclaim the coming of Jesus, the Christ. It is a life lived not dictated by our present sufferings, but informed by the promises of what God has in store for all things. It is a promise that is big enough to save you, to save me, to save us all. Thanks be to God. Father, we come now confessing still, even as people who take a moment to pause in this hurried season, who attempt to slow down just a little bit to hear your word in amongst all of the words of the commercials and the season, we confess Still, it is difficult for us. We certainly celebrate your coming the first time, but we are also called to, to remember that you are coming again. And God, that is difficult. It's been a long time. And people laugh at us. But Father, now more than ever, in a world that is falling apart, we need strength of your promise of hope empower us as your people to speak hope into the situations that we find ourselves living in personally but also into the situations of our families and our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers we are deeply concerned about things that are happening around the world but God the best way for us that you know to empower and impact those things are to deal with those that are right in front of us. So God, help us to be people full of hope. Not because we are optimistic, not because we believe things might get better, but because we know from your promise that the days are surely coming. May that empower our lives, open our hearts to the world around us, and bring hope. Father, this is our prayer on this first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of hope. We pray this in your name. Amen.